Isaiah chapter 6. Really glad that you're here. Give me a few moments to develop this familiar passage you've seen many times. I think that because of the direction I feel the Lord's leading us to go in during the Jubilee, this message is very timely. Maybe come at it a little bit differently than you might expect. I know one time I preached this message a number of years ago, and the guy said that it wasn't until the king died that Isaiah came to church. That's not true. Isaiah continued to go to church even when he didn't see the Lord high and lifted up. The question you have to ask yourself is, is what do you see when you come to church? I mean, do you see who's in the parking lot? Do you see who's in the pew? Do you see, you know, who's wearing the shoes that you were planning on wearing for a special occasion? I, I don't know what you see. People come to church and to see all kind of things. But the reason we're supposed to be here is, sir, I would see Jesus. What we're supposed to do is, is open up the Word of God, this Bible, and look into the mirror of His Word and see how much there is a contrast between us and Him, and then realize that if we'll learn to be conformed to His image and get the mind of Christ, which is in the pages of what you have right there, you're going to be a lot better off when you hit the judgment seat of Christ. Now, if you're here and you're lost today, I would simply say this to you. Today is a great day for you to be saved. Amen. You say, why? It'd be the best day you could ever imagine. You say, why? Because instantaneously you can go from going to hell this morning to going to heaven by this afternoon. And that means that your whole life will change, but more importantly, eternity will change. Notice in the passage, you realize you're standing. Let me read a few verses here to get you set. The Bible says in verse 1, In the year King Uzziah died... I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled... Notice where it is. Where? Look at it. The temple. He doesn't say He saw a 900-foot Jesus standing at the foot of His bed, in His bedroom, in a house church. He said in the temple. It's like me saying, because I saw a deer killed on 295, I'm going to go uh, stand off a light post out there and get my rifle and hope another deer comes by. You say, preacher, you wouldn't find deer on 295. That's like saying you're going to find Jesus in a bass boat. You might find Him when it sinks. Notice the Bible says that above it stood seraphim, each one above the throne He's talking about there. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the post of the door moved. Must have been an independent Baptist church. The post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Brother Larry, you pray, would you please, and ask the Lord to help us. Lord, already it's been good to be here this morning. We thank you for it. Lord, thank you for the safety and travels for so many that have already arrived. And for those on the way, God, we pray for them. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the good singing. Lord, that lifts you up. Yeah. Thank you for your presence, God. Thank you for just coming in with us for a little while, Lord, and sitting with us. And we ask for your help with the preaching now. Be with your preacher. Be with, be with him, Lord, as he speaks. Be with him as he preaches, God. Yeah. Give him every word that he needs. Lord, may it, may it be as you speak to yourself. I pray you'd use him in a mighty way. God, may your power rest upon him. Might you breathe on the message. May you help our hearts to receive it. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 Thank you. You can be seated. Would you leave your finger there in the book of Isaiah? And for those of you that are not familiar with the Bible, turn back toward the book of Genesis, the first book in your Bible. And I want you to come all the way to a little small book called Chronicles. It's the book of Kings. And all I want to do is is point out something that is very apparent in the passage. When you preach in an expository manner, you let the passage speak for itself. In other words, the Bible speaks, not the man speaking. The man is speaking for what the Bible says, but it's the Bible doing the talking. Oftentimes, the reason we've gotten away from biblical preaching is, is because we don't really like what the Bible says, so we fit it to us, and then we will say, we hope that the Bible says, but... Anybody that has been in any business, especially those of you that are in the military or the police, you have a thing called general orders and SOPs. Can I get a witness? All right, so then what happens is this. You're required to go by those general orders and SOPs. You're not held accountable to them until they issue them to you. Is that right? 
So what happens is, is that when I first signed up there and I got my, all my, they gave me this big book about yay thick in those days. It didn't have all the computer stuff, big old huge three ring notebook of general orders and SOPs. I had to sign every single one of them. You say, why? Well, because when you messed up, you couldn't say you didn't read it. But you also watch, didn't know how things operated because you might have come from another department. You might have come from a different way of doing things. And so they gave you that, not just so that they could hang you up if you messed up. They gave you that so that you would understand clearly what the parameters were for you to operate in. The Bible is given to you for that same fashion or point. The Bible's written in such a fashion as to expect that if you're saved, you're going to be in church. And secondly, you're going to be looking to do what God wants you to do. That's why He gave you a Bible. So He wants you to read it, not just as a matter of always correcting you. The very idea that I go to the Bible every time just because I I need a spanking is ridiculous. I go up and saying, Dad, I know I'm going to mess up today, so go ahead and beat me. If my dad whooped you, you did not want but accept the ones you got and you were glad to get away with the ones you got away with. Or later on I found out I didn't get away with as many as I thought. He knew about them. He was just merciful. Here's the problem is oftentimes when we view the Bible, we view it in the negative context as if it's just trying to catch us messing up. Here's a novel idea. If I take it from the positive standpoint and just do what it tells me to do, it's less likely to be negative and more likely to be positive because now I know what the rules of engagement are. I know that if I do what's right to do, I get gold, silver, and precious stones. If I do what's wrong, I get wood, hay, and stubble. Is that a fair statement? So maybe one of the reasons that when you come to church, the reason that you see everything except the Lord is because you're looking for nothing more than the preacher to preach on what it is you already know you're guilty of. And then, and then you're mad at the preacher because he's picking on you. Because you came in the door thinking, he's going to pick on me, right? Boy, I'm going to preach on lying in just a moment. Notice this King Uzziah. You say, why? It is significant that in the year he died, the Lord showed up. Why do you think the Lord would have that by the Holy Spirit pinned into your Bible unless it is significant? Doesn't mean Isaiah wasn't going to church. It doesn't even mean that Isaiah hadn't had revelation. As a matter of fact, he had enough revelation that in Isaiah chapter number 5, he's pronouncing woes on the nation of Israel. Isaiah is like that little book. It's called the mini Bible in the book. The first 39 books are about the second coming of Christ and the second 27 books are about the second coming of Christ along with the first coming of Christ. So it's got 66 books in it. So it's not that Isaiah is not a contemporary of the people of his day and that God wasn't speaking to him. But this time when Isaiah came to the temple, because Uzziah had died, the focal point was no longer the earthly king. Now Israel has an opportunity because why? By this time, Uzziah has now been reigning 52 years. He started when he was 16. So he's around at 68 years of age. It looks like when he's about 67 or so, as he begins to get old, he begins to do some really stupid stuff. If you read the parallel passage in the book of Kings, you find out that he did what his, brother, his dad, who was murdered by some very wicked people there, he then listened to Zechariah. He did what God told him to do, the way God said for him to do it. And as long as he did what God said to do, God prospered him. It's when he chose not to tear down the high places and to allow the people to continue to worship Baal and Balaam and continue to offer sacrifices and stuff in the high places that eventually the law of gravity caught up with him and caused him to stumble. Notice, if you will, if you're taking notes, notice in verse number 6 of chapter 26, 2 times 13, probably not a coincidence. Notice uh, verse number 6 that Uzziah was a very powerful man, very powerful king. He broke down the walls of the Gath and the wall of Jabeth and the wall of Ashdod, built cities about Ashdod among the Philistines. Notice verse 7, God helped him and he became very prosperous. Just using peas to help you to maybe better uh, remember the message. He was very popular in verse number 8. He must have had Facebook. No, he was noise abroad because he was a great king and because God blessed him. 
And because God was allowing him to prosper, look, he was very, very popular. He built and he dig many walls. He had property in verse number 10. I have to make a point. Look in verse number 11. He was preparing for future wars. So he had plenty of substance. In verse number 12, he was protected and secured and secured the people. He prepared and provided for other people in verse 14. I'm sorry, I'm in 2 Chronicles 26. I'm so nervous this morning. I forgot where I was at. 2 Chronicles 26. That's going back toward Genesis. I remember saying that. And then I said Chronicles, but I didn't say, why didn't you call me out? Because Sophie's like, oh yeah, he's in Second Chronicles 26 and he's down. He's in verse number 11 now. Verse 6, powerful. Verse 7, prosperous. Verse 8, you won't get this off the internet. He's very popular. Verse number 10, he has property. He's prepared for war. Verse 11, he's protected. He's very secure. In verse number 12, he prepares and provides for other people. In verse number 14, could you come all the way down to verse 15? The Bible says, And he made in Jerusalem engines inventing by cut, invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones withal. And his name spread far above. And he was marvelously helped. Wouldn't it be great if the story stopped right there? But look at the next statement. Until what? He didn't need God anymore. When he was 16, and he didn't know Squatola, and he didn't have the support of the people, and God wasn't behind him, he had enough sense to listen to an old preacher, old prophet by the name of Zechariah. His dad had done pretty well, even though his dad was murdered by some wicked people because he listened to the old prophet. So he learned enough to realize, I don't know everything. I better listen to him. That guy's hooked up with God. And so if I listen to what he does, he'll make sure that what I'm doing doesn't conflict with what God wants me to do. And he stayed on the path to the point here that for a number of years, looking about 40 to maybe even 45 years, he developed everything you could imagine. And if you were to look at that, you would almost think that this city was as great as the days of Solomon because of the fact that they were so well known. They were so powerful. They were so prosperous. Nobody dared even mess with him. But what happened to him is what often happens to us in the life today. Make a practical application. When we really need God, man, do we beg God, plead with God, and we're like the guy falling off the roof, and all of a sudden, God help me, God help me, oh God help me, I'm going to fall three stories, I'm going to die, I'm going to fall like a preacher did yesterday, he fell off the roof, he landed on his head, he's in glory this morning. You say, why? I'm praying, I'm praying, then all of a sudden the nail, never mind, Lord, the nail got me. What makes you think the Lord didn't put it there? The boy fell eight stories. He fell out of it. They were having a a big party up there, a springtime party down in uh, Daytona Beach, I believe it was. And somebody shoved him off the rail up there. And it was during the wintertime. But it had rained about five or six inches uh, two or three days before. And in the bottom of that otherwise empty pool, there was about a foot of water. And they said if it hadn't been for that foot of water, that he would have died because he would hit that concrete. But that foot of water saved him. Boy, taking credit for that would probably not be a good thing. But you know what we often do? Boy, when we need God, we ask God to help us with our marriage, to help God deliver us from financial trouble, to help God help us in everything from a test to diagnosis with cancer. But when we're strong. I don't need God anymore. Raising them kids and all of a sudden you're thinking when they hit terrible twos, you're thinking, Lord, if you don't help me, there's going to be a murder on the horizon. I'm going to make a basket case out of this Moses in my life. I'm going to stuff this kid in the back and pitch it with tar. And I'm going to put him out in the bulrushes and hope the gators get him. (laughs) Now, some of you beautiful little kids in here, you're thinking my parents would never think that. You don't know what a brat you were when you were two. When you were cutting teeth and when you wanted everything and the whole world was all about you. And when you didn't get your way, you would have thought you were a Baptist. You pitched a cotton pick and fit and made everything. You didn't care about where you were, what you were doing. It was all about you. You were at a restaurant. You wanted your diaper change. You screamed. You don't care if it stunk up the meal for everybody else. It's like, hey, I want my diaper change now. You ever been in a restaurant when some of those kids are in there that have the parents trained? They know exactly when to cry. And then what they do is they play the bottle game. 
They knock the bottle off on the floor and then the parent picks it up. And they knock the bottle off on the floor and the parent keeps picking it up. I'm thinking, you knock that bottle off on the floor one more time. See, that's how I was raised. You say, what would happen? You know, when I was young, they just took the bottle away, said, you can't handle a bottle, you can't keep it on the tray, so you don't get it anymore. And if you scream, you'll have something to scream about. Now, I was raised old school, for some of y'all are like, no wonder you're warped. Well, okay, maybe so, you know, but I have a little PTSD. Every time I see a baby in a bottle, I'm like, oh, don't drop that bottle, you know. But all of a sudden, that kid grows up and begins to grow, and you're going through things, and when that kid popped out, they didn't come out with a manual. And I don't care, your parents don't know everything, and now you're calling everybody, and you're like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do with this kid. And if you're a grandparent, you can be like, I still don't know what to do with this kid. Here, take them back. I don't want them anymore. (laughs) And then here's what they do generally is, is that the grandparents get them all hyped up on caffeine and sugar. Like I saw a parent, a grandparent, had to be a grandparent. I mean, if they're a parent, they're like Abraham and Sarah old, but at any rate, they're sitting at a restaurant up there and they're pouring Dr. Pepper and Red Bull and giving it to like a four-year-old. And I'm like, oh, I would not want to be the parents of that kid. And then toward the end of the meal, the parents come walking in. Hey! And the kid's like, oh, hi, oh, you know what I mean? And they're all in the kind of like, I don't know what's wrong with him. I'm like... <laughs> Ask me, I know. They're giving them Red Bull. I think it was the, the parents like, payback. You know, this is how you are when you were little. So here, take them back. In it any right? And when he was strong. You know what happened when he got very comfortable in the position he was in? You know what happened to Uzziah? He forgot that he was doing exactly what God called him to do and he kind of got wore out with doing that and he wanted to do something God didn't call him to do. And he said, you know what? I'm going to do something I want to do. I'm going to go into the temple and I'm going to be the big dog. Now, you know what happens? You can read this in the passage because I have to get back to Isaiah sometime before or after lunchtime. But at any rate, you know what happens in the passage. Uzziah comes along there and he gets walking and he's got a censer in his hand. That's to offer prayers and stuff like that. The Bible strictly forbids him from doing that. And he knows it. He's not stupid. He's been raised under Zechariah. He knows what he's doing. It's not like I walked in, I didn't know, you know, what the offering plate was for. So I was using it as a Frisbee. He knows exactly what's going on when he walks in there. And you know what he figures? Hey, I don't see why I can't do it. They're doing it, so why shouldn't I do it? And the Lord's like, because I didn't tell you to do it. Amen. How do you know that? Because the priest comes in there and he has 80 other preachers with him. And they come up there and they say, now listen, king, now I've got to understand to go against the king could cost them their life. Saul killed 70 men just because they were affiliated with David when David came to get some bread and a sword. And Saul killed them all just because of their affiliation. All he had to do was speak the word and the priest would have been killed on the spot. And they walk in there and they say, Hey, King, listen, appreciate you. Finally glad you came to church today. It's a real blessing to see you here. About time. It's been a while since you've been around here and so on and so forth. But even though it's the first time in a long time, you're overstepping your boundary. You're doing something that God told us to do. We don't put our nose in the king's business, but the king ain't supposed to put his nose in our business. And so they try to correct him. Well, guess what happens? He gets mad. He didn't like the preaching. I just thought about that one. (laughs) And he got mad at the preacher. And guess what happens? He gets so mad that he takes that censer and he flings that censer down the hallway of that big place. And how dare you tell me I'm the king and so on and so forth. He pitches a fit. And about the time he does, right where that mitre would fall on his head, leprosy hit him right in the middle of the forehead. He goes from being a great king to being a leper. Just like that. One day. Just like that. You say, why? He stepped into God's business. He got His feet where only God's feet belonged. Now, isn't it interesting that Isaiah, who was his contemporary, some say even related, maybe even a cousin, who's been dealing with him all this time, cares about him, been coming up to the temple, has been mourning about the king, and in the year that he died, the Bible says he saw the Lord high and lifted up in his throne, his train, 
fill the temple. What was really going on there? Well, it really wasn't Uzziah on the throne the whole time. It was God on the throne the whole time. But even for that great king and even at to the demise of the nation of Israel, God still wouldn't allow Uzziah to overstep what God told him to overstep. Pretty serious thing, would you think? Could I ask you a question? What is your Uzziah this morning that keeps you from seeing the Lord when you come to church? Not what is your Isaac. What's your Uzziah? Where is it along the way that you got so self-sufficient and so self-sustaining and you know so much about it? You have your own home church now. You have your own home Bibles. You have your own internet services now. You don't need God anymore. You don't need to go to church anymore. You say, why? Oh, well, when I'm powerful. Boy, isn't it interesting that before you got so powerful, man, I mean, your head was bowed and your knees were bent all the time. Your hands were folded in prayer and it was, oh, God, help me and oh, God, help me. And when you didn't have a pot, uh, didn't have a uh, uh, place to go to the bathroom or a window to throw it out of. How many of you know what a slop jar is? Okay, so you understand the rest of you ask somebody. I'm not going into it, but. But before you got there, isn't it funny how close you were to God? How connected to God? How much you needed church? And now all of a sudden it's kind of like, I don't need church anymore. By the way, he said he went into the temple. I think that was in the passage, right? And that's where he saw the Lord. It wasn't, I saw the Lord and he directed me to the temple. It's I went to the temple and God showed up. It wasn't the fact that God told him, I'll meet you in the temple. He simply kept coming until God showed up. Because it was right to do. But there's a difference in Isaiah and Uzziah. Though the names sound somewhat synonymous, the difference is, is Isaiah never thought he could do without God, and Uzziah thought he could. Now, I'm not talking you out of your salvation. Let me make that clear. I believe in eternal security. And your church attendance and coming with the right heart and having your eyes opened up is not proof of your fact that you're saved. Catholics go to church every Sunday. That doesn't mean they're saved. Though some of them, they very well be. Seventh-day Adventist Jehovah's Witness, they would tell you that proof that they're saved, if they're a full-blown Calvinist, is that I attend church. That has nothing to do with whether you're saved. Here's my question. Forget about trying to turn it back on me and say that I'm trying to make you prove you're saved. Pause for a minute. Why is it that church used to mean so much to you and now it's kind of like something you do when you don't have something else to do? Why is it that on your daytimer, it was always Sunday was X'd out. Now it's full of everything. I mean, from sports to sleep. It doesn't have to have any special thing. It's kind of like, I just slept in the day. It's my only day. Right? Nobody's ever said that before. It's my only day. It's your only day. You ever think you might not have any only days if it wasn't for Him? I'm just saying, in the Old Testament, the Sabbath was given to the Jew for a sign. That's a Saturday. In the New Testament, it's a privilege to be able to go and to gather on the first day of the week. The Lord said, oh, y'all don't need a law to make you go. I'm sure now I'm let you free from the law. You come because you want to come. Well, Lord, every time I go, I don't get to see you. Well, it could be because also when Isaiah walked in, you know what it said? He saw also the Lord high and lifted up. That's because until you get a little further in the passage, you don't realize Isaiah is distracted by his own self. You say, how do you know? Well, first of all, he starts talking about the people he's around. But before he does that, you know what he says? I'm a man of unclean lips. You know how he discerned that? He got to looking at the Lord. Look in the passage right there. I like the fact, come back to the book of Isaiah. We won't spend any longer there with Uzziah, although he's dead and rotten now. He's got a, uh, he doesn't even die in the palace. He dies out in the home. Cal- Cass, he's a leper. But look in the passage right there in the book of Isaiah and notice what happens when he sees his train fill the temple. That means the whole thing's full of God. Right? Yes. And the seraphim are there. Right. Right. Interesting, only passage in the Bible talks about the seraphim. Interesting that if you want to have a worship service with God, that's a good example to follow. You say, why? They got six wings. With two, they cover the hardest thing that Uzziah had a problem with. With two, they cover their face. 
Doesn't matter who they are. Who are they? Seraphim? What's their name? Seraphim? Right, they have a first name, Seraphim, Seraphim. You couldn't tell them from one seraphim to another seraphim. The only way that you can recognize these seraphim is, is number one, they got the time to cover up. Nobody knows who they are. Their reputation's not on the line. They're not interested in you looking at them. It's significant. He put it in the Bible. I'm not just preaching. It's not like, well, he just sounds like he's just getting on desk. Well, no, if you come to church looking for yourself, then, you know, so many stars in church, sometimes you can't see Jesus looking to be recognized, looking to be appreciated, looking to have the opportunity to do that. How come they get to preach? Why didn't I get to preach? Why did I get to sing? What about this? What about that? How much I gave? How much I didn't give? What you do to get recognition goes to who you think you are as far as your reputation. Cover your face up. We're here to see Jesus, not hear all about whatever you did this week. We won the game. Okay, good. Talk about it in the parking lot. I got a big investment. It came through today. I mean, I hit the numbers big on Wall Street or the lottery. I'm in a Baptist church. I know somebody like, oh no, we would never do, well, maybe an occasional scratch off. You know, I mean, I'll give the Lord 10% if I do, you know, really that scratch off, you won the $5 you gave him, 50 cent? Anyhow, anyway, you know what happens to us? The first thing the Lord mentions is when He's high and lifted up, isn't it interesting? He directs your attention not to Isaiah, but to the people that are doing it right. Let's look at the positive thing first. What happens? I got some seraphim here, and they're doing nothing but talking about me. Amen. They're talking about me. Why? They don't want you looking at them. Number two, if you look in the passage, they have six wings. Two, they're covering their face. I'm pretty good with math. And two, they cover their feet. That means we got two left, which we'll talk about in a second. Two covering their feet. You say, what? Well, they're not interested in you knowing all about where they were. Right. Right. Amen. I was at the club last night. Hmm. Or whatever you call them now. In my days, you know, it's the yeah. disco or whatever. No, it was no. <laughs> Tracy's like that's that's bad. <laughs> the bar. Yeah. Where you been? What you been doing? Your accomplishments in the world and how great you are. And I told a fellow one time who was a little sideways with me. Answer a fool according to his folly, and I probably shouldn't have said it, but I said I think that you probably think that song "How Great Thou How Great Thou Art" is written about you because you must sing it in the mirror to yourself. <laughs> oh no, you didn't. Oh yes, I did. Why is it that he gets to upbraid me and I can't tell him? Listen, I can tell you what the problem is. The spotlight ain't on you. So you're like a spoiled brat and you don't want to learn. You don't want to sit down and buckle down. You don't want to learn your algebra, your history, your science. So you become the class clown in the church house because you're a trumpeting elephant. Number two, in that as a sub point, some of you are still hung up on where you used to go, what you used to be, and you're tied up with things that have happened in your past that the Lord has put under the blood and said, I don't care if the brethren remember it till now till the cows come home. You have been forgiven. You are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and you can get up and you can go on. You don't have to worry about your past. You say, why? Well, you know, somebody's always looking at my feet. Well, cover them up. If you don't live that way anymore, stop talking like it. Stop reminding people of back in the day. Remember when I was in high school? God, help us. Hope you get senile fast. We are tired of hearing, Paul Paul, about when you were in high school when dinosaurs were on the earth. The kids look at you sometimes, you know, well, when I was in high school, they're like, did they have schools back then? (laughs) Yeah, right after Noah landed up there on Ararat, you know, they opened up the first public school. (laughs) Yes, they had public schools back then. But isn't it interesting that oftentimes church becomes a place where we talk about where people have been and where people are going and what we're planning on doing instead of the Lord showing you with two they covered their feet. Ain't none of your business you say, why? Because some of you today, you know what God might say? I don't know where you think you're going, but I'd like to change your direction. Amen. Don't be focusing so much on where you've been or where you think you're going. Say, Lord, I guess it don't matter. As a matter of fact, when you're here, All that matters is you're here. 
Number three, because it's just so apropos and it is so clear right in the passage, the Bible says, and with two, they did what? They flew about. They flew. What's it say there? They did what? About what? Telling other people's business? They got on the internet and they decided to put out over social media what everybody else was doing? I'm not trying to be harsh with you. I'm trying to set you up for a revival meeting that's coming. Amen. And if you don't want it, okay, well, that's okay. Be Uzziah. I already know what your Uzziah is. But you know what the Bible says? When they flew, they talked about the Lord and said, Holy, Amen. holy, holy Amen. is the Lord God Almighty. Amen, brother. Amen. You say, well, what is that? Well, see, when you get so busy talking about the Lord, you ain't got time to talk about yourself. Amen. Maybe God's not really done anything for you. We have a choir that will be singing here, I guess, tonight or tomorrow, one of the nights during the meeting. We're going to sing a couple of songs. You know what our choir's named? The Done Somethings. I just shortened it down, but the Done Somethings. You say, well, what does that mean? It means God's done something for them. Amen. And they just get up and sing by letter. We may not have everything feathered out like these boys did. I mean, they're pros, man. They can really do it. We just get up there and open up and just open, sing by letter. Just open up and let her fly. You say, why? God did something for us. You know, you get so busy talking about what God did for you, you'd be surprised how hard it is for what somebody else is doing to you can slip in there. You'd be surprised how you talking about somebody else can slip in there. If you just learn to talk about Jesus, you'd be surprised how He will slap your mouth shut when you start to say something that ain't holy. You'd be surprised when something starts coming up from that old nature and the Lord's like, if you just say holy... You'd be all right if you just get your focus in the right place. If you just be looking at me and talking about me instead of talking about everybody else. It shouldn't be that in 2019, we're still preaching stuff that was preached in 1940. They didn't have social media back then, but they had gossipers and slanderers. And people that had Pinocchio noses, not just from lying, but from sticking their nose in everybody else's business. I told a young man this morning, I said, hey, brother, I love you. Just want you to know I care about you and I'm here, but I ain't no bird dog. He said, I understand that, preacher. I get that. I know where you are if I need you. I've told some of you before, I'm in your back pocket, but you won't ever find me in, on your page in one of your books. You say, why? It ain't none of my business. You, Some of you take it upon on yourself to let me know whatever's going on and everybody and that kind of a stuff. You ever wondered? Maybe I already know. <laughs> You ever wonder if maybe I'm just letting God take care of it instead of me jumping in on it? Amen. You say, why? Pinocchio knows. You know what I find? I find when there's one going this way, there's three coming back this way. I'm just trying to help you. You want to see God, don't you? Yes, sir. Well, he starts off in the passage that Uzziah's dead. That means that Uzziah got in the way. Because why? Because Uzziah thought church was always about him. Amen. You ever been that way? Uzziah had been a king for 50 years, folks. You know what he thought? There's one place I'm not getting recognition or appreciation and I'm going in there to get it now. I'm going to be the preacher. I'm going to be the priest. I'm going to get my recognition. There's one place that somebody is higher than me. And it's the church and I'm going to get it. That's why he went in there. What's your motive for coming to church? Well, I want to see Jesus. Well, that's if His light doesn't shine so bright that it faces mine. Now, it's unless Jesus gets lifted so high, people forget about who it was that turned the light on Him. He doesn't need your or my light on us. On him. As a matter of fact, He's so bright. If I'm correct, I, I think you're a Bible student. You might have to correct me on this, but I think He says when He's describing the New Jerusalem that there's no sunlight nor moonlight there. Is that right? you got a master's degree, doctorate now. You, so am I right so far? In Revelations back on the far right-hand page, left-hand column, if I remember correctly. No, left-hand page, left-hand column. But didn't he say this? For the Lord is the lamp and the light thereof. Yes, right. He doesn't need me and you to shine it on Him. Right. He shines all by Himself. Amen. All we're supposed to do is be casting shadows. I'm supposed to reflect His light. That's all. That's I'm, I'm supposed to be. I don't have my own light. But you know what I can do? 
I can take that thing to the point that if you're trying to see Him, I can get so much up in your face. I know I'm invading your space. Just be patient with me. Okay. You trust me, right? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm not going to hit you or nothing. I just could try to kill me. But, but I can get so much in your face that even the glory of God can't be seen by you. In the year King Uzziah died, you say, what happened? It's almost indicative of the fact that Isaiah is so consumed with the problems of his king and so consumed with the fact that he can't seem to get Uzziah on the right page that it takes Uzziah dying for Isaiah to be able to see what should have been obvious to him all along. But you know what can get in the way? Grief. Anger. Frustration, aggravation, agitation. Wrath, malice, reputation, money, security, safety. Am I preaching? The the lack of having a companion. Or the companion you have. (laughs) And so much that thing can get here. You couldn't see Jesus even if you had the ability with a flashlight. You can't find Him. Amen. You say, why? Something's standing between you and Him, Uzziah. Something got in the way. Uzziah said, I'm going to church. I'm the king. Can you imagine what it looked like when the king pulled up? Had one of them big pumpkins out there drawn by horses. <laughs> looked like Cinderella's chariot. Had all the entourage, had all the bodyguards. I mean, when the king went to church, it wasn't just the king coming to church. He had everybody coming to church with him. I might even say that when the king wasn't at church, it kept other people from going to church. But who would want to hear that? Who would want to hear about your responsibility as a Bible believer to set an example? Who would want to hear that, Uzziah? The question would be is, Uzziah, you know something? If you had been being at church, you would have known better than to do what you did in church. But my question is, is how many people weren't in church because Uzziah said, I ain't going. I know you would never do that. I understand that. But think about that. Here's this little 68-year-old man, thumb-sucking, bottle-drinking, diaper-wearing king who had been prosperous and who God had blessed mightily and became very strong. And then he said, now I think it's time for me to go to church. But when I go, I'm going to go how I want to go and they're going to do it my way. So when he walked in, he was already set up to fail. It's kind of like, this is what I'm going to do when I go to church. The Lord's like, "Uh uh-uh, you might be the boss in the kingly realm, Uzziah. You ain't the boss in here. And it ain't the preacher. You on holy ground, boy. Pardon me. You are on holy ground, boy. You are overstepping. You know what the rules of engagement are. Man, when he walked in the door, them preachers are like, you're kidding me, man. The king's here. Man, we're going to have a revival. It's going to be like the days of Elijah. Well, the whole whole town's going to turn out, man. Ain't this a blessing? The king finally came to church. Well, yeah, the king did come to church, but you don't understand. He is there to tear up the church service. Because before he leaves, he's going to get everybody upset. I mean, I know, I, again, I know you're not this way, and this is not for you, it's for whoever's around you. Some of you have already put up your umbrellas for the millennial reign. I sure wish so-and-so was here to hear this. Okay, Uzziah, I know you don't need it. You're good. Don't hide behind your sickness. I appreciate you being here even if you are sick. Listen to me. He walked in the door with his mind made up. He didn't even ask. Because in his mind, he knew what he was doing was right. He didn't care if it hair-lipped the cotton-picking devil. I'm going to do what I want to do. Why? Because it's church. 
Everybody just does what they want in church, don't they? Ain't that what it's like? Let me ask you this. You walk in tomorrow at work and you walk in and tell your boss, I'm doing what I want to do. If you own a business, you're just going to let your employees do what they want? Why is it when you come to church, you think, I do what I want to do? Why do you think that? This is more sacred than your job or your family. Amen. There's a way you're supposed to do things. You might want to check with God on that. I ain't talking to no preacher. He ain't going to tell me what to do. Chill out, man. Relax. You the boss, Uzziah. You the king. When you're powerful, popular, prosperous, protected, safe, got all the bases covered, somebody now, and now you're going to tell God how it's going to be. Better watch it, Uzziah. That boy didn't just die instantly. You know what happened to him? He got hit with leprosy. That's a long, slow, sometimes painless death. They just rot. Every time he looks in the mirror, man, he looks like he's got a third eye. He looks like Cyclops. I mean, I mean, no amount of flesh tone paint and putty knife is going to help him at all. It's worse than having a zit in the middle of your forehead. That'll go away. He's got leprosy. And God's the one that gave him the leprosy. The preacher didn't pronounce a curse on him. But the preacher did say, you got leprosy, you got to get out of here. King or no king. Shall we hurry through the passage? We're almost to the end. You know what you see in those cherubim? I mean, those seraphim? You see them covering up their reputation. You see them covering up their past or where it is that they're going or where they think they're going. You see them only talking about what it is they're seeing because God is so much a part of their life. Nobody can get between them and God. They're literally staring. They're like the cherubim over in Ezekiel 1. They're mentioned again in Ezekiel chapter number 9. You know what they do? They're at wing to wing like this on top of that mercy seat. You know what they're doing? They're looking at Him. You know what they're doing? They're coming there saying, it's about him. It ain't about me. Who are you? I'm a cherubim. What are you doing? Whatever he tells me. Where are you going? Wherever he tells me to go and I'll be straight back. The Bible said they flew straight. They go straight there and straight back. Didn't you stop along the way to talk to something? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. What are you looking at? Him? Why? I'm here for him. How come you stretched out that way? Because I'm stretched toward him. Well, aren't you worried about what's behind you? No, he's got me covered. I'm looking at this. That's what church is supposed to be, not what it is nowadays. Social media has made you think church is all about you finding what everybody's doing. That's why you spend more time in the best of you talking about whoever won the ball game yesterday than you do talking about what your Bible read, read yesterday was. All I know is two teams played yesterday, worked that game for a bazillion years. One of the other team, one of the teams won. I don't, you don't have to tell me. I don't care if you watch the football is not the devil, unless you're going to have to go on Sunday in this church. <laughs> but that's just my opinion. I mean, I, you can do whatever you want to do. I know God understands. And then you wonder why your kids and your grandkids take as much interest in church as you do, old man, old lady, you old bat. You Uzziah, you. There used to be a day and time where the old people set the standard. And you going to go to church with you. I went to my grandparents. He plowed me like a rented mule. And I'd come Sunday, come, I'd get up and get tired. He'd say, good. You can be tired in church, but just like you can be tired here. And Pawpaw, can't we go fishing? No, we ain't going fishing. It's Sunday. But Pawpaw, I'm only here for a certain amount of time. Then you can stay longer, but you're going to church on Sunday. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. So unpopular, but I'm just saying. Yeah, I get it, Uzziah, because then when you come in, it's all about. I don't, I, you know, the Bible said we don't stand one day above another. You know all the verses, don't you? Just like the drunk knows, Jesus drank wine. <laughs> Bible says, little little wine for thy stomach's sake, and often infirmities. It's all right to drink. You know all the verses, don't you? All the verses that justify missing church, don't you, Uzziah? We're talking about the church. We're talking about what God loved and gave Himself for. Amen. Yes. Amen. The one He's coming to rapture. Yes. Amen. <laughs> I still think it would be funny and I'm still going to say it. I think it would be great if the Lord comes on a Sunday night. Amen. <clears throat> you say, why? Oops. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be like Thomas. I sure wish I'd have been there on Sunday night. Amen. I probably could have used that. But Thomas had something to do. I know why Thomas wasn't there. Come on. He didn't want to be. Right. Don't say, don't say why it wasn't there. You say, why? You'd have built a monument to it. Mm-hmm. See, there's a reason that Thomas wasn't there. Yeah, but look what Thomas missed. i got to hurry. 
As soon as he sees the Lord, he gets down to the nitty gritty. He's in the presence of holiness, purity. You know what it does? It convicts him. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. If your lips are unclean, what does it say about your heart? Out of the abundance of the heart, the... You know what he said? And he said, guess what? I've picked up some habits from some people I've been hanging with. And I dwell in the midst of people that are unclean. Look at it. It's in the passage. Brother Mitch, he picked up their bad habits. I don't know why I'm picking on you today. He picked up their bad habits. You know what he realized? I'm being affected by the people I'm hanging around with. You get a friendship, you better treasure it and work to keep it. If it's the right one. If it's the wrong one, you better amputate it. But if it's the right one, you should nurture it. You say, why? Friends can help keep you out of trouble. Friends are not friends that get you in trouble. That's right. Right. Good preaching. Yes, sir. So you should preach that to the young people. They picked up their habits from the old people. Don't tell me you wouldn't be on the dance floor if you weren't afraid you'd break something. <laughs> and you can't even do what they do nowadays anyway. Be like a pine straw man anyway. Brother Joe, you know what happens to him? Are you still with me? You know what happens to him? He said, I'm unclean and I'm dwelling with people that are unclean. I've gotten comfortable around unclean things. I've gotten comfortable. Couldn't be, Isaiah, that the reason you hadn't seen the Lord is because you've gotten a little too comfortable with unclean things, could it? (laughs) They're affecting your heart now. That's affecting how you think now. Now Isaiah is ready for some preaching. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says the post of the door moved. That, that's this thing here. You know what's bolted to this right here? There's three of them right there. You know what that is? They're called hinges. You know what happens when the door's out of catty, cattywampus? It's out of, you know what happened? The door's stuck. You know what that means? When God moves in, the smoke fills the temple. There's nowhere for it to go. It's got to get out. You say, what's it got to do? got to wash out that unclean stuff. When the doors move, that's where the hinges hang and the door can open. And now all of a sudden, the place can breathe. The smoke, the anger of the Lord has filled the place. You say, why? There's some things that need to be cleaned out. Because what they brought in from outside had been brought into inside. And the seraphim shows up. This would be pretty scary. He takes some tongs. I have some in my office that a friend of mine made me. Right when you look in my door of my office, you look straight ahead under the windows over there, you'll see the tongs from off the altar. You know what he does? He takes the tongs. You say, why? It's not because the seraphim would have burned himself. It's because he's fixed them to touch something holy and he's not allowed to touch it even as holy as he is. He takes the tongs. From off the altar. Watch. It's important. After Isaiah had gotten things right, recognized he was the problem, and that in some ways he was no different than Uzziah, the Lord said, now you're ready for preaching. And he goes down to the altar and he takes a hot coal. And he comes over there, and I don't know about you, but man, you talk about some hot preaching. That seraphim's walking right at him with that flaming, burning ember. And he walks up and he says, what is he doing? He purifies his lips, indicating, I'm purifying your heart. He's not there to hurt him. He's there to cleanse him. Message from off the altar, but not till Isaiah did his part. Remember the story I told you years ago about the old preacher being in, out in Madison in that prison? Remember how I told you that about 200 or so guys came in in a driving rainstorm on that hot August afternoon? 
That sky was pitch black. That thunder was rolling like cannon. Lightning looked like a laser show. They're standing out there in their blues. Hats down here in their hands this way and standing at attention waiting to get brought in. Pouring down rain. I mean, I mean, just we're thinking they're going to turn them back. They're standing outside. The correctional officers are back underneath the shed side like that. And they bring them in one group at a time, one thing at a time. And they come in like this. March into that. And as soon as they walk in, they're dismissed. They walk in and they start piling up at the altar. Piling up at the altar. Sopping wet like they've been standing in the shower with their clothes on. Pile up at the altar. Piling up at the altar. I didn't realize the significance of it. And that preacher walked by. You know what he said? Mm -mm. Boy, we liable to have a meeting tonight. Amen. I said, why is that preacher? He said, because they start where we usually finish. Amen. That preacher preached. A message I've heard him preach dozens of times, but a man, I mean, he preached that thing like Elijah on Carmel. Man, that thing, you talk about power on it. And when he stepped behind that board and said, boys, I'm telling you now, the reason I'm not going to hell is because I got coverage. And he tapped Jesus on the cross. You could have heard a pin hit that floor. And he looked out from behind that board and he said, boys, of course, he's 90. You can get away with that. He said, did you hear me? I'm not going to hell because I got coverage. Amen. Ah, he can back if I ever saw the Lord. High and lifted up. My goodness, man. That place came apart at the seams. They were shouting. They were hollering. Half of them were bawling. Half of them were down at the altar. They got their coats off, wet coats slinging. I can still see raindrops coming off of them, man. So much water. The correction officers are backed up in the corners and stuff like that. And I just remember him just looking down there at me with sort of a glazed look in his eyes. You say, why? God's ready for to give them some preaching now. Because they did their part first. Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips. See, in Isaiah 5, Lord, these people are wicked. But when God shows up in Isaiah 6, He said, I'm wicked. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I'm dwelling in the wrong place. And I want to come out. Well, let's put a positive in. The Lord says, I'm looking for a man to make up the hedge. Yeah. Isaiah's like, you're looking for a man? How about me? Would you give me the privilege? How about me? Me. You know, the Lord would have never considered Isaiah if Isaiah had not recognized a lot of Uzziah in himself. Here's the whole story. I could have told you this 20 minutes ago when we started. Watch the difference. Uzziah was made great by God, but he thought he was made great by himself. Isaiah had just the opposite. Well, God's this and God's that, but in the meantime, guess what happened? God got to think. Isaiah got to thinking... Doing pretty good. And the Lord's like, You don't see any likeness of Uzziah in you? You know what he said? Yes, Lord, I do. And the Lord said, Well, I think you do just the man, just the man I need for the job. Because you learned the lesson. You came to church and it's about me, it ain't about you. But if you make it about me, I might can do something with you. Amen. One of them left church the wrong way. And one of them left church the right way. One of them left church a leper. One of them left the church a servant. And wrote 66 chapters in one of the most prophetic books in the Bible. Amen. And what do you know about Uzziah? Well, he was very powerful and prosperous. But you know what you know about him? 
Yeah, he's the one that went in there and God hit him with leprosy. He died outside the city. You remember Uzziah's failure. You remember Isaiah's success. Why? Because they both went to church, but they both got two entirely different things. One came out right. One came out wrong. One winds up being, for us, someone to follow. The other one is somebody we shouldn't follow. One was a king. One was just a preacher. Just a witness. Tell me which one is the better of the two. Because in eternity, being a king won't matter. Being a servant will. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Let me ask you this question. Maybe today you might consider when you came to church today and you're coming this week, maybe Uzziah is kind of getting lifted up in his heart. Same way in Isaiah 14, the devil fell, I will, I will, I will. And maybe you got a different spin or a perspective. Folks are coming. Don't wait. Come on. We've got room for you. You can turn the front row into an altar. It doesn't matter. Come on. Come on. Don't quit coming. We'll play the, the organ here in just a minute, but come on. Maybe today you're sitting there thinking to yourself, you know something, Lord? I'm a little more like Uzziah than I am Isaiah. I want to be fixed. You know what the Lord will do? He'll fix you. It may burn a little. Miss Pat, you come on. It may burn just a little bit. It may hurt just a tad. But I'm telling you now, it'll purify you. It'll cleanse you. If you change that focal point instead of letting whatever's in front of you right now, whatever is keeping you there... Whatever it is, it doesn't matter how small you may think it is, it's big enough to keep your eyes off Jesus. The truth is, is for Isaiah, I mean for Uzziah, all it was was his self-perceived reputation. God spoke to you, you come, she's playing. People are still here. People are still coming. We'll wait. 